So I want to summarize now some of the properties of light that we've seen and introduce one more property. The speed of light, as I've said, is given by 1 on the square root of epsilon naught mu naught. It's about 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second. And this speed here slots into the wave equation here, so this is 1 on c squared. We also looked at the energy carried by light, and this results in an intensity in watts per meter squared. This is the intensity in watts per meter squared, where E naught is the amplitude electric field. And remember, this includes the energy in the B field, although we don't write down the value for B, we just wrap it all up in the value for E because the energy is symmetrically distributed. An additional property of light that I want to introduce is momentum that light can carry. So the momentum carried by light per unit volume is the intensity I divided by C squared. So this is momentum per meter cubed, so kilograms, meters to the minus two, seconds to the minus one. So let's consider some volume of a plane wave. So this yellow box here is some volume, and it's tracking along with our plane waves here. The plane waves, remember, have constant electromagnetic and magnetic field amplitudes through their planes. Inside this box, there'll be some amount of momentum being carried by our electromagnetic waves. The momentum divided by that volume will be I on C squared. So the momentum inside that volume is the intensity divided by C squared multiplied by the volume of our box. And this is in the case where we're considering light of uniform intensity, so plane waves. Now if you have momentum in light and the light's absorbed, the light can exert a force, and this force is known as radiation pressure. So we can use it to find a force. We'll consider a yellow box of light again. The surface area here is A, and it's traveling at the speed of light, C. So the rate at which a volume passes through this surface here, dV dt, is C times A. A really simple way to think about this, imagine the length of this box is C, C the speed of light, then this entire box will pass past this point in one second. So the volume per second is C times A. The momentum, as we've said before, is I on C squared times V. So we can combine these two equations to calculate the force, remembering that force is dP dt, the rate of change momentum. So force is equal to dP dt. What's dP dt? Well, we can calculate it from this equation here, and we're going to get I on C squared times dV dt. What's dV dt? Well, we know it from this equation here. So we substitute C times A into here, and we get I on C squared times CA, which is equal to IA on C. But I, the intensity times the area, is the power, assuming the intensity is constant. And so the force, the radiation pressure force on something, is the power divided by the speed of light, where P is the power of the light in watts. So if I have one watt of light shining on my head, the force is the power 1 divided by the speed of light, which is a pretty small force. Now this assumes that all the light is absorbed. The momentum of the light becomes the momentum of the absorbing object. If I shine this light on a mirror and the light's reflected perfectly, then I'll get twice the momentum because the light is reflected back and the change of momentum is twice what I've just calculated. I want to discuss now briefly the entire electromagnetic spectrum, that is, how we interpret these electromagnetic waves as we change the wavelength. Down here at the long wavelength end, so in the one to hundreds of meters range, we have radio waves. To detect radio waves, we use things like radio telescopes and very large antennae. So they're either sort of the si about the same size as these radio waves, or at least the same scale. And so these are big detectors. Then we get into the microwave regime. So the detectors here, they're still antennae, but they're still, now they're sort of smaller, on the order of a meter or so. And so microwaves can be used for short range communication links, that kind of thing, or heating up your food at a particular frequency that is resonant with the um, hydrogen bonds in your food. Then we get into a regime that was be broadly called optical, so UV, light, and infrared. Of these, a very small fraction of the wavelengths we can actually see with the naked eye from about 380 to 780 nanometers. And that spans the range from purple through to red, all the colors in the rainbow. In the infrared, we have near, mid, and far, and these can be used for imaging things that are warm. All of these frequencies, these wavelengths, all the way from UV through to infrared, can be detected using semiconductor technology. So CCDs for cameras, for example, or photodiodes, and indeed for solar cells that we use for collecting energy with photovoltaic arrays. 
the UV end here, so these are the ones that damage your skin, the higher energy wavelengths that come from the sun, they range from sort of 10 nanometers to 380 nanometers. And beyond that we get into the X-rays, they can also be detected using semiconductor technology. And beyond X-rays we have the gamma rays that might come from space, for example, and now we have to use technology that's rather different. The gamma rays can't be detected directly, they have to smash into something to make um, other particles can then be detected using uh, optical techniques or semiconductor techniques.